Hello everybody, this is Dr. Kevin Connors, and this video is on uh, the series of understanding your DNA, but this is on the dietary consideration. So, what kind of diet is best for me? That's the question a lot of people have. Should I be eating vegan? Should I be doing the GAPS diet? Should I be doing the keto diet? Should I be doing a paleo diet? Should I, you know, just eat all the sugar that I want? I don't know. So your genetics can tell us some some uh, some hints, but nothing is perfect to find the diet for you. Nothing is going to be perfect. Now the diet will the genetics will give us hints, but um, we'll talk about that in all my other videos. I say that you know you don't make complete dietary decisions based upon your genes because there's other things that go along with it. <coughs> your, there are environmental factors that affect what you should be eating. Your, your current diet and your past diet for over the years and current environmental factors like do I have Lyme disease? Do I have a chronic H. pylori infection? Do I have heavy metal toxicity? Am I living under enormous amount of stress? That imbalances our microbiota. That um, if we have a lot of, of uh, uh, endotoxin production because of a chronic infection, that decreases our immune system or can throw us into an autoimmune situation. And any gut inflammation is going to equal inflammation everywhere else in the body. Okay, so inflammation of the gut equals inflammation of the brain and the rest of the body. That affects our blood-brain barrier, that affects our immune system's response to every disease, and can set us up for every disease. So you could argue that your, the gut really is the, is the first telltale sign of disease everywhere. So start by healing the gut is really important, and lots of times our, our cancer patients struggle with that. Is so why are we dealing with the gut? I have brain cancer. Why are we dealing with the gut? I, I don't have... Um, I have breast cancer, not, not colon cancer. But if you don't heal the gut, you don't balance the microbiota or work on that, because it's not like you're going to heal it, it's that you're going to be constantly working on that, you are going to be constantly chasing your tail. I've also said that the, just looking at the genetics is not the proper way to look at um, what you should be eating or shouldn't be eating, because there's more to that. Um, the best way to test for food sensitivities, not necessarily overall diet, but should I be eating gluten, should I be eating tapioca, should I be eating corn, should I be eating this, is to do a blood test. And the, blood, the lab that I recommend, I've said over and over, is through Cyrex Labs. Um, that's the best lab to do that blood test because it looks at different peptides. So let me explain what that is. So when you're looking at gluten, for instance, the protein that people are sensitive with gluten is the gliadin. When you look at dairy, people aren't looking at, you know, you, I don't take people off of dairy because they have lactose intolerance. Lactose is the sugar in dairy. You, you go off of dairy because you have an intolerance or sensitivity to or antibodies to the casein. That's the protein. So it's the protein in the foods that really causes the issue. So, and it gets even deeper than that. With gliadin, some people will say, well, I had my doctor run a, a, a test for gluten, a blood test for gluten, and it was negative, so I could eat gluten. Um, I hate to tell you the bad news, but that test is worthless. So if you, that blood test for gluten, gliadin antibodies or gluten antibodies would only be positive if you had leaky gut bad enough that the entire gliadin protein was getting across the gut. That means you are really sick. You have your gut borders are so open that a, that a giant multi-trailer semi could drive through there. Because what a protein is, here let me show you, a protein is a long chain of amino acids. So think of this as a long chain of different amino acids here. What a protein is, is the sequence of that amino acid. So the sequence of a specific amino acid chain makes it gliadin, gluten. Another sequence of a different amino acid chain makes it a different type of protein, casein in the case of dairy. 
In your intestinal tract, your enzymes, think of it as the scissors here, will go and cut up these amino acids, the, the bonds between the amino acids. So it breaks up the protein. So how you break down a po protein is with enzymes that break the bond, the chemical bond, between the amino acids. And eventually the desire is, in the process of digestion, is to snip every one of these bonds, or at least get them down to a group of two. That's called a dipeptide. If it's in a group of more than one, in a group of two or more, it's called a peptide, which is a, which is a piece of a large protein. So enzymes in your intestinal tract, made by your pancreas, break down proteins into peptides and eventually down into amino acids. Now it's not gluten anymore. So if I had a healthy gut wall and I had a really healthy pancreas, that's you know two mass assumptions that we've already gone over most American situations, um, I would break down all my proteins into amino acids and then the amino acids are small enough to cross through the gut border and to get into the bloodstream. They're not protein. They're not a protein anymore. It's just an amino acid. It's not gliadin or gluten anymore. It's simply an amino acid. And then our body uses that amino acids to make other proteins. That's why you'd consume proteins, because you want to break them down into amino acids so your body can make certain other proteins and enzymes to do other functions in the body. That's the whole purpose. The problem comes in is when we have ill digestion, so we have a decreased digestion, so we're not breaking those down very well, and we have a leaky gut, so that instead of, you know, the, the gut border not allowing any more than a single amino acid or a dipeptide, two amino acids bond together across, it will allow larger things across, like a peptide of five amino acids, a peptide of 15, a peptide of 40, etc. Now these are gliadin peptides. And when they get into your bloodstream, so here's a picture of leaky gut borders, allowing things in instead of having tight junctions, it allows things in that never should have gotten in, like food now antigens, because it's something that your immune system is going to go, what the heck is that? Let's kill it. Because it's not an amino acid. It's not a dipeptide. It's a larger peptide. And your immune system doesn't recognize it. And it says, we need to kill it. So if that takes place, now you spark an immune reaction to kill that thing. Of course, it's not going to be able to kill it because there's nothing to kill. But you can develop antibodies against that peptide. That's not a good thing. So what you need to do is not run an antibody test against the entire gigantic long chain uh, amino acid, you know, of amino acids in one protein called gliadin. You need to run a test for the individual peptides um, so that you can really see if you're gluten sensitive. So I know it's kind of hairy, but Go with me on this. The test that you want to run is a test through Cyrex, and they have multiple different panels, but this is Cyrex Labs. They are the, the best at running that test and getting very specific and getting, you know, not showing you a whole bunch of foods that you don't have to stay away from. These are showing the exact peptides that you actually have antibodies to. So that's how you would find out if you need to stay away from, from, uh, casein and gliadin, which is gluten. But in truth, if anybody has chronic issues, you really should stay away from gluten for sure. And you should think about giving up gliadin as well. Now, also in my other videos, I have specific videos on histamine. So I'm not going to get into that in this video here. So, But watch the videos on histamines because that goes into a 15-minute 20-minute lecture just on that. But there's some other things that people are sensitive to that you can see on the genetics, and that's sulfur, sulfites, sulfates, and oxalates. So I just want to touch a little bit about that, and I want to talk a little bit about glutamate. Now, 
all of those things are coming out of this pathway. And again, we want to give credit to SeekingHealth.org for this beautiful picture here. But this pathway is part of my transulfuration pathway. And the purpose of the transulfuration pathway, again, is to uh, make SOD through that pathway, make glutathione through that pathway. So those are things that get rid of of reactive oxygen species and uh, reactive nitrogen species and their intercellular antioxidants. But also in that pathway is how you break down sulfur and sulfates, how you get rid of that, and then ultimately through your urea cycle. It's also how you get rid of oxalates and how you deal with oxalates. And so those can all be issues. People will say they have a sulfur allergy or they they react negatively to drinking wine um, and they think they have a sulfite allergy. Well, I'll tell you about 99% of quote-unquote sulfite allergies are not sulfite allergies. They're defects in the transulfuration pathway. So supporting those defects can really help you be able to digest those things and be able to break them down. Because if you can't break them down, then they become a sensitivity in your body. So we'll talk a little bit more about oxalates in a bit. Glutamate is also produced through that pathway. Glutamate is in, uh, um, an essential nutrient in your body. It acts as a, uh, as a neurotransmitter in your brain and in your muscles as well. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. It's excitatory to your brain. It does really wonderful things. It helps you get up in the morning, helps you concentrate, helps you stay focused. The problem is, is if you have these defects here, the BHMTO8 to the CBS699 defect, you can have, you're producing more glutamate and ammonia than really you should. Now, that tends not to be a problem if you're able to get rid of it. In the case of ammonia, if you have very few defects in the urea cycle, then that's okay. You typically will be able to flush out that ammonia through your kidneys. That's typically where you're going to lose the ammonia. Glutamate, on the other hand, if you produce too much glutamate and you can't get rid of it, the, the gene that gets rid of glutamate is the GAD1 genes. So if I have defects that look like this with my BHMT and the, and the CBS699, <coughs> excuse me, on the upper left-hand corner, plus I have the uh, inability to convert glutamate to GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter, <coughs> then I'm going to probably have excess glutamate in the brain. It gets, it gets worse because there's other genes that we don't, uh, we don't actually show on your profile, but I get to look at them. Unfortunately, we don't have them on the patient profile, at least at the time of this taping. We might by the time you're listening to this. There's a GLS gene that they're finding that glutamine converts to glutamate through this GLS gene. And if a person has defects like this, the 2, 2, 1, and 1 that this person has, defects on this gene speed the conversion of glutamine to glutamate. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> well... Glutamine it is, is an amino acid that is found in proteins. <coughs> Excuse me. And, okay, so where am I getting that? Well, every time you eat meat or every time you eat beans or every time you eat anything that has protein, you are going to consume some glutamine. And you need glutamine, so glutamine is good. Matter of fact, most gut healing products that are out there in the market contain a lot of glutamine because L-glutamine, that's typically what you'll see on the label, is extremely healing to the intestinal tract and the epithelial cells. So glutamine is actually a good thing. The problem is, is if I have these GLS gene defects, I'll convert glutamine to glutamate quite quickly. And if I have the GAD1 defects that is under, that is covered by this, I don't convert glutamate to GABA. So I'm going to end up with excess glutamate. Well, what's that going to cause? Well, excess glutamate is going to increase OCD type symptoms, increase anxiety, increase uh, inability to let things go. A uh, person perseverates on thoughts, can't let thoughts go. They can perseverate in ideas. They can perseverate in actions. They can't settle down. They tend to be worriers. They tend to, would describe themselves as depressed, but it's not real true depression. It's anxiety. 
And those are all glutamate things. They tend to have OCD things. It can be, it can lead to ticks. It can lead to Tourette's. So um, glutamate is a bad thing in excess. Remember, nothing is a good thing. Nothing is a bad thing per se. But glutamate is certainly a bad thing in excess. And typically, we don't see very many people with low glutamate levels. We see a lot of people with high glutamate levels. A matter of fact, you've heard me say it in other videos that they purposely, the food industry purposely puts glutamate in foods because it's stimulatory to your glutamate receptors and it makes you addicted. It's called a flavor enhancer. You've heard of the most common, which is monosodium glutamate. It's a flavor enhancer. It makes you taste good because it's stimulatory to your tongue receptors and then your brain glutamate receptors. The problem with this is that over time, you, you actually make more receptors on the cell membranes. So you have cells with excess glutamate receptors and you become even more sensitive to it. Your microglia also are stimulated with excess glutamate, which stimulates an immune response in your brain. And that's not a good thing. So it causes inflammation in the brain. So it's excitatory in the brain. It causes inflammation in the brain. And that inflammation actually causes neurological degeneration. So new studies are out that excess glutamate can lead to early dementia, uh, uh, memory loss issues, brain fog, early Parkinson's, and early Alzheimer's. It's not a good thing to have. So people will say, oh, I react to MSG. If you react to MSG, you have excess glutamate already in your brain. Okay? So if you are attracted to nacho cheese Dorito chips or flavored chips or, or processed foods that um, have anything that has, says natural flavoring in it, here's a list of some MSG-containing things. They, they don't have to list it as glutamate anymore. It can be listed as a whole bunch of different things. Barley malt, malt flavor, soy sauce extract, soy proteins, protease enzymes, all these have glutamates in them. And so it's in a lot of different processed foods. And if you're eating a lot of processed foods, pretty much guarantee you have excess glutamate. And this is very damaging to your brain. This, these are called neurotoxins. These are listed as neurotoxins because they're toxic to your brain. This is a major cause of ADD, ADHD issues. Okay, super important. But from a genetic standpoint, you can really see the picture and you can say, well, you are going to even be more susceptible to this because you have these defects and you make too much and you don't get rid of it very much. You don't get rid of it very well. The hyperammonia it leads to all sorts of problems too. So dealing with this is important. So what do you do? How do you do that? Well, you have to stay away from glutamates. You have to read labels, eat fresh things, you know, go back to that slide and look at that. Uh, Google different high glutamate foods that you want to stay away from. Basically anything processed. Start buying organic and start eating better. I mean, that's the key. You're going to have to not go out to eat. Sorry, I was at, I'll name the name, Applebee's. I went over there. It was about two, it was about two years ago when I said, went in there and I said, I'm highly allergic to MSG. I'm not. But I said, I'm highly allergic to MSG. Can you give me a list of things on your menu that don't have MSG? The waitress went to the back room, came back about 10 minutes later and said, um, every single thing on our menu has MSG. That's pretty scary. So, um, understand that it's everywhere. So trying to cut down on that as much as possible can really help you with a lot of your symptoms. So if you have these defects that we just listed on this, really watch glutamate levels. That would help a lot. Well, glutamate, we have to kind of talk about protein because remember, glutamine in protein breaks down into glutamate. But, glu but other things. What, what is protein? Protein is a series of amino acids, right? So some of those amino acids break down into other neurotransmitters as well. Tyrosine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan break down into serotonin, dopamine, uh, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So 
well, that's really good. So you need those neurotransmitters, right? But if I have the defect like you see here on the left, it says serotonin in the MAO defect. If you have a double or single allele defect on this gene right here, <coughs> and you're having symptoms of excess serotonin, which, what are symptoms of excess serotonin? Well, it could be fits of rage, fits of anger, easily agitated, easily upset, um, prone to just uh, being uh, um, short-tempered, um, just kind of have an angry personality. And by the way, you might actually have to ask some loved one if this is you, because many times you don't recognize this. You say, this is just who I am. That is a sign of excess serotonin. Excess dopamine symptoms would be similar to glutamate in that you can be fixated. ADD, ADHD can lead to OCD type symptoms. You're a very driven person, which can be very good, but maybe to the point of being a workaholic, excessively driven, get stuck on something and can't let, the, let that go. This could be your personality, and you choose careers based upon your genes. You know, so it's not a bad thing, but it's good to know how to, to cushion that a little bit. So if you're not happy that you're easily, you know, bite people's head off, um, which you shouldn't be happy about, what you could do to calm down the serotonin production would be to calm down the consumption of foods that would stimulate more serotonin production. Well, what are those? Well, I just said that tryptophan, uh, tyrosine, and phenylalanine are precursors to serotonin, dopamine, and the rest of the neurotransmitters. So if I cut back on those, maybe not. I'm not going to go vegan, but I'm going to cut back on those, <coughs> I will slow down the production of serotonin. And a person can see symptom changes literally in a day. They decrease their protein consumption and their serotonin levels drop down. And you see this a lot with people that have aggressive personalities. An aggressive personality who has excess serotonin, if they're living off of protein because they started a bodybuilding program, so they're eating meat like crazy, they get more aggressive. And you see this many times with males and sometimes females that are abusive personalities. They become more, more abusive, more aggressive. The more protein they eat, the more they work out. They're stimulating amino acid breakdown from protein. That amino acid's turning into other things, and it goes through the biopterin pathway. It turns into neurotransmitters, and it affects the person's behavior. Okay? So there's a genetic reason why a person could be overly aggressive, why a person could be, you know, uh, you know a, a personality that can be a little nasty. So when I talk to patients with that, many times they'll put them on a low-protein diet, cutting back on the precursors. So it can be very helpful. The flip side of this is true. So if I have symptoms of low serotonin and low dopamine, meaning can't even get out of bed today. I just don't feel good. I just can't get going. They have no drive. That means their dopamine is down. And they're sad and they're blue and they're melancholy and they're depressed. These people should not be eating a vegetarian vegan diet. They need protein. And I've told lots of people, you know what? You need to get up and eat a piece of chicken. What? For breakfast? Yes. Get up and eat some protein. Okay? So many times people that are on a vegetarian vegan diet, that is a code word for eating tons of carbs and sugar. Okay? Uh, that's not good for you. That's not good for that type of person. Eating more carbs and sugar might actually be beneficial for the person who's overly driven and overly aggressive and short-tempered and, you know, cutting back on the protein, eating more greens, eating more veggies. Follow me on that? Down in the right-hand corner is the MAT gene. The MAT gene takes methionine and converts it to SAM. 
person with a lot of defects, if this was a cancer person, patient in my office and they had this many defects in the MAT gene, we would cut back on their protein consumption. <clears throat> I'm not in favor of every cancer patient not eating any protein. But especially if you have MAT gene defects, you don't want to be feeding excess methionine because methionine and glutamine can feed cancer. Cancer cells can feed off of glutamine and methionine. So some amino acids can actually feed cancer cells. So if you have a lot of MAT gene defects, cutting back on protein can be beneficial. Follow me? So here's two completely different pathways that could suggest eating more protein or less protein. Okay? because you have to look at the precursors. So here's foods that have a lot of methionine in them. And you can pull up these methionine lists. Um, but basically it's protein. So if I have a lot of MAT gene defects, then I'm going to cut back on my methionine, cut back on my protein. Doesn't mean you're going to cut it out. And again, if you're not having any symptoms and you don't have any cancer, then maybe you should just leave it alone. But I'm just talking about people that methionine won't give you the symptoms. But if you're dealing with cancer and you have a lot of MATG defects, I would highly suggest you go on a lower protein type diet. Oxalates are something different. They're produced through the transsulfuration pathway. And they're also produced um, in your gut um, and you can't get rid of them in your gut when you have leaky gut issues. Um, so that I, I'm actually making a whole video on oxalates to help you understand that because it is a problem. And the symptoms that it will really cause are going to be uh, gout symptoms, gouty arthritis symptoms, can't even be rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, can't even be degenerative arthritis symptoms. And the most common thing you think with oxalates are kidney stones. So... If you are prone to kidney stones, ever had kidney stones, or familially have had kidney stones, like your parents have had kidney stones, really important to, number one, stay hydrated, um, to uh, support these different pathways, um, and to avoid foods that have high oxalates in them. And some of these are really good foods. You just want to make sure you're, you're not eating them in, in excess. Okay, so let's look at this thing. Oh, Swiss chard and beets, oh, those are supposed to be so good for you. Raspberries, they're really good for you. Yeah, they are, but just because Swiss chard or kale and spinach is good for you, it doesn't mean you should be making a spinach kale shake every day, um, and that's what you consume for your breakfast. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing for everybody. It's about balance, remember. Maybe eating these giant hamburger and fries is never good for you, but it's about balance even with that. You don't have to become a guru to stay healthy. So it's about having that balance, about doing the right thing 80% of the time, really. That's really the secret to health. So you support the SNP, you look at your diet, having that balanced diet. So that's it on this, this initial kind of brush over dietary things. Make sure you watch some of the other videos under this section. And also make sure you come back to this section because I'm constantly adding new stuff. So, um, you know, refresh your page or go back to the page and look because there'll be more things that can help you along the way. And as new information comes out, I'm constantly studying, going to seminars and such. I try to put it on videos for people to, to learn from. Again, you um, are doing the genetic pathway, but if you decide to want to become a patient, you follow the first steps thing on our website. Uh, and please be respectful of our 23andMe agreements. You can't call the office and just ask a quick question. It just We can't do that ethically. So I appreciate it. I hope you were blessed by this and you learned much from it. Um, look at your report and even just because I uh, um, suggested some things, you may look at your report and go, wow, this one really fits me. I'd rather do something different and take something different. We have a ton of things on our web store available for you. So please feel free to browse that too. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.